Welcome to the Open Line First Friday edition of the Journey Home Program. As you know, this particular episode each month is a time for you to ask whatever question you might have about the Journey Home to Jesus Christ and the Journey Home to His Church. My guests tonight are two women who have been on the Journey Home before. In fact, their episodes were two of the favorites that you've told us you like through your, uh, your mail and your emails. Christine Franklin and Rosalind Moss are joining us, not just because I invited them to be here, but they happen to be here to prepare for a 16-part series that they're filming next week, and we'll have a chance to talk about that in a little bit. But remember that you're an essential part of tonight's program. Any question you might have about the Catholic faith, they're here, ready to do the best they can to answer. So if you would like to call us with your question, call us at one 800 2219460 or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Well, welcome to the Journey Home, Thanks, Chris. Marcus. Good to see you again. Thanks, Thank you. And I, I meant that is that there are certain programs that we receive many, many letters and emails from, and both of your episodes touched a lot of hearts. And it's good to have you back. In fact, I wish we had three or four hours to recount the journeys that you shared now over a year ago when you were first on the program. I will say that your journeys are both written up in detail in the book Journeys Home, which the audience will see information about during the break later. But why don't we take a moment to give a quick one minute summary uh, to help them remember your journey. Maybe we can bring in with you. Chris. Sure. Um, I was raised fundamentalist, as you know, and I accepted Jesus as my personal savior when I was five years old. I was raised in a home that was devout. Um, we were taught to love the Bible, and we were taught that the highest calling you could have would be to be a missionary, to take the good news of Jesus Christ to other people who haven't heard of him, and, and to take salvation to people who were not headed to heaven. So I, I grew up, I went to Bible college, I married a very wonderful man, and we prepared for the mission field for eight years in our early marriage. Uh, in 1991, we went to Costa Rica so I could learn Spanish. In 1992, we went to Guatemala as evangelical missionaries. And you've asked um, for one, you know, for me to give just a short thing. Okay, I, I'm going to recount hard. something. It's really hard. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you something that happened when we were missionaries in Guatemala that I, that I see as a key point. Uh, we used to drive about 10 miles away to go to church every Sunday. And we lived a block from a Catholic church. I was, we were driving home from church on a Sunday morning, and my little girl, who was five at the time, said, Mommy, why don't we go to the Catholic Church? <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, I realized I had to say, I don't know. Because I realized everything I knew about the Catholic Church, I had been told by someone else. I had never read a Catholic book. I hadn't talked to very many Catholics. I'd certainly never read a Catholic religious book. And I wasn't about to say to my child, well, the Catholics, this and this and this, whatever I'd been taught. I wasn't sure in my own heart that it was true. And it would be considered hearsay in a court of law. You know, it's like I needed evidence because this was my child and I needed to give her the truth. Um, it was that needing to know the truth. What's the truth that drove me eventually to become a Catholic? At that point, I had no sympathy for the Catholic Church, but what I knew was that I didn't know. That's, what's, that's one of the things that started it. While we were Protestant missionaries, and about three years later, we were received into the church. Was it, was it uh, that um, relationship with your child, specifically, that God used to kind of s put the scales aside to realize that you needed to know more, or was there other things happening? Well, I, I would say that there were a lot of things happening. there you got to tell a child, and you're... That's right. And, and if you're a missionary, you have to tell people how to get to heaven. Yeah. And if you're going to tell people how to get to heaven, you have to have it exactly right. Mm -hmm. And as a Protestant, I knew there were lots of versions of Christianity. I had my personal version, and the Pentecostals had their personal version, and the Baptists had their version, and the Lutherans. And we were working in, an, in a place with 200 denominations of Christians, just missionaries. And it was that thought of, gee, we kind of create our own Christianity, and, and how do we get to heaven? And if I'm telling people, this is what you have to do to get to heaven, am I getting it right? I have to be sure. 
And I was kind of at that point thinking, well, maybe you can't really be sure. You just love Jesus and accept him in, in faith, and that's the best we can hope to know. And that wasn't enough for me, and it certainly wasn't enough to tell my children. I was thinking about that, <laughs> that how many people come back to church after they become parents. All of a sudden, there's a new responsibility that drops onto their shoulders. In your case, and here they are, as you said, 200 different denominations around teaching contradictory things, and all of a sudden, my children are starting to understand. Right. How can I know that what I'm delivering them is the truth? What about right. in your case? Actually, a little bit Chris different I, journey, but... A little bit different, but Chris and I actually entered the church at the Easter Vigil 1995 before we knew each other, <laughs> uh, the ways of God. But um, I grew up uh, in a Jewish home, uh, as you know, Marcus, and um, sat down every young uh, year of my life to the Passover table waiting for the Messiah to come, knowing that he was the only hope that the world had. And... Um, when I was 32, I, for the first time, met such a character in my life as a Jew who believed that Christ was the Messiah, and not only the Messiah, but God come to earth. I knew they were troubled Jewish people, but I <laughs> thought, uh, in case they're on to something, in case God entered history, that we could know him and know the very purpose for mankind on earth, in case they were, I followed these neurotic Jewish believers <laughs> around. And they led me to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and showed me how the Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to Christ, the Lamb of God. And I gave my life to him in 1976 as an evangelical Protestant. And Chris, I knew I was going to heaven. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. And not only were uh, other denominations not going to heaven, but anyone from my church wasn't going to heaven. <laughs> I knew. Um, and my first Bible study was taught by an ex-Catholic, who was taught by an ex-priest, who taught me straight off that the Catholic Church was a cult, false religious system, yep. leading millions astray. And for the next 14 plus years, I tried to save Catholics from what I believe with all my heart was a false religious system. Until the summer of 1990, when um, I came across through a publication, uh, This Rock Magazine, uh, Catholic Apologetics, kind of a phenomenon to me. How could, I never knew that Catholics had a defense of their faith. And here was a magazine that was explaining their errors, I thought. Mm -hmm. And in looking through that, came across a tape set by Scott Hahn, Presbyterian minister, which you yes. are, Marcus, who became Catholic. And I thought, I don't know, I don't care what he called himself or what he functioned at or, or what his title is. He couldn't have known he could not have had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and become Catholic. And it was in listening to that tape series that um, God sent, uh, uh, I say a holy shock because it was Scott Hahn's words that for the one that looks into the claims of the Catholic Church, 2,000 years of church history and the fathers, to that one will come a holy shock and a glorious amazement to find out that what he had been fighting and perhaps trying to save people from was in fact the very church Christ established on earth. And I stood there so paralyzed. I was a week away from going on staff with an evangelical church as uh, director of women's ministries, thinking to myself, oh no, oh no, there can't be any truth to this thing. But the impact of that moment was such that it set me on a compelling course to the Catholic Church, which I entered four and a half years later. Uh -huh. And now looking back, though I knew at that moment in the summer of 95, in a split moment of time, where before I would have, five minutes before I still would have wanted to save every Catholic, um, if I look back on it now, the impact of that moment was such that I think in that split moment of time, I knew it was true mm. in one second. I think I knew it was. And I think now that the whole of my four and a half year journey was finding out how on earth it could be. <laughs> how on earth it could be. And uh, here I am, praise to God. Mm -hmm. You know, I do remember that your particular episode, Rosalind, uh, which you talked about the, the sacrifice of the Mass, received the many, many, many calls because of what you talked about the Eucharist. Yes. It so helped people appreciate the both Catholics and non-Catholics. And uh, the power of that, and as I listen to remember both of your stories, how God brings different people along for mm -hmm. different reasons from different places, yes. but it still emphasizes the power of God's grace. Yes. 
to reach us uh, where we're at and break through all the, the stuff that we protect ourselves with. You know, we have our first call already. We'll take our first call, and then we're going to come back and talk about your new program. Let's okay. take our first caller. Hello. What's your name, and where are you calling from? Hi, this is Mike from New Jersey. How are you doing this evening? Hello, Mike. What's your question for us? All right, great show. Uh, question for you is just, just generally how to, how, to, how to just get started with evangelization and apologetics. As I was walking back from church, as I regularly do through the City Hall Courtyard in Philadelphia, I passed by um, an evangelizer on the street. With my Vatican II missile in hand, I think he recognized it after so many times to pass him. Uh, you know, I, I think he took a shot at me about um, the Catholic Church making cement idols and praying to them. And, you know, I, he definitely directed that at me. And as I asked him if he knew what the word veneration meant, he immediately sent, went off into a tort of, a, you know, a, a track that clearly wasn't related to what we were talking about. And it was hard for me to relate with him. And I just wanted to get your opinions about, um, how, do you you know, how do you address a situation like that, and how do you get started? Okay. How do you get started with evangelization? You know, um, one of the things I, I was thinking as, as you were uh, talking is that um, people are sincere. People are sincere. That gentleman that came up to you, I think, um, I remember where I was at trying to save every Catholic. And, and the first thing I, I, would, I would think in my heart uh, to someone like that is thank God in your heart for the grace accorded to that gentleman hmm. because he loves God. And we have a mandate as Christians to take the gospel to every creature. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that in the only way that he knows how. And I know that what got me, before I was a Christian and then when I was an evangelical looking into the Catholic Church, were people and Catholics who knew their God, who knew their faith, and who had the sure hope and the confidence in their heart. Mm -hmm. um, and more than winning, in a sense, initially, certainly passing someone on the street, any particular uh, point, which you may not have the time to do and, or, or, and he may not have the uh, motivation to follow through on. But to walk away from a Catholic who he believes is not saved mm. and say to himself, he seemed like he knew Christ. I don't understand why he's <laughs> Catholic, but that's a man who knew his faith, yeah. who loves God. And it might open up uh, a question in his mind to look further into the faith. Evangelization really begins with love. It's I mean, love. It's got to begin love. with love. And we must not use truth as a cudgel that phrase, speaking the truth in love, mm -hmm. I mean, they've got to be there. And I'm one that always believed in relational evangelization. And so you build relationships with, with people. What was it St. Francis has said, you know, you share the gospel and if necessary, use words. I love it is, that. You know, in other words, it's got to be in our life. I love that. I was going to say, um, if you pass this man every day, find out his name, find out does he have children, Bring him a candy bar once in a while. If it's hot, bring him something to drink. It's, it's Catholics who live their faith that get the attention of people who think that we're not Christians, right? It's, it's the doing and the, and the living the faith that, that makes someone go, hmm. You know, and after a while, it's like you say, it's the love, yeah. it's the care. And maybe rather than always giving someone a quick answer, First, ask them why they think what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, worship yeah. statues? Uh, what, why do you think why do you that? Think yeah. I do? Yeah. Right. Give what them the opportunity to fight them yes. to, and, 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 sit and kind of make a deal with them. I'll tell you what, you tell me everything you think about the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. the when you're done, let me have a chance to share you what I believe about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's giving them the first opportunity to share. Uh, build a relationship. Right. Uh, I know that your program that you're coming up has to do with sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's a good end for that. Why don't you take a moment to share with the audience this program, which you're here at EWTN to film next week. Begin, Chris. Well, we're, uh, we're very excited, aren't we? <laughs> we were asked, I was asked to, d to develop a program, and I asked Rosalind to help me. In fact, I, I told them I, I wouldn't do it without her. <laughs> I, I thought we both have such a, a passion for sharing the the truth of the church that I really wanted to work with somebody who shared my passion in that same way and so what we've done is we've we've developed over the last few months a, 
a series of programs aimed at really normal everyday people. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to be sharing a lot of um, our background, each one of us, um, what we told people and how we tried to evangelize people, uh, things we believed about the Catholic Church, things we were told, what we were taught, and contrast that with what the Catholic Church actually teaches. Hopefully we'll reach people who are maybe kind of wavering about, am I in the right church or not? Or, or maybe some people who've left the church. Um, um, EWTN has said that they will probably be putting this program into Spanish, so it's really mm -hmm a program for the Western Hemisphere. For We like to think for just the ordinary person to learn more about their faith. And um, Each program will be on a topic and we'll have topics like, have you been born again? And um, do I have to work my way to heaven? And will I be in purgatory well, even if I'm not Catholic? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the Pope is your Holy Father, no matter what you think. So we're going to be touching on all of those topics, but hopefully in a way that's that's accessible because we're ordinary people. Yes. <laughs> I'm excited to see this and also to see your interactions. I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun seeing you and also hearing again your journey as it's reflected in those different themes. Uh, let's take our first email and maybe we'll come back to talk more about the, your program. It says, Dear Journey Home, did you ever find it hard to get past the fundamentalist ideal of worldly separation and mm -hmm. reach the freedom that is in the Catholic Church? Thanks. Rosalyn, you. Did you find it hard to get past the idea, the fundamental fun idea of worldly separation? And to reach the freedom that is in the Catholic Church. Thanks. You know, on my journey I did. On my journey I did because the difference between the Catholic and the Evangelical is not simply doctrinal, but it is a way of seeing. Right. It's an entire new world. Mm -hmm. And as I looked into these things and I saw the freedom, which to me was very scary because it was getting away from a very defined world that I had, I began to think to myself, if this is true, what God have I known for, for my 18 Evangelical years? And it was a little frightening to me. But as I ventured out with the help of God, um, I tell you, I entered a world that was so magnificent and beautiful and full and lovely and free. In fact, I had an evangelical, um, uh, when I became Catholic, uh, one of the gals that I worked with had left the Catholic Church and become a born again evangelical fundamentalist Christian. She said to me, Roz, why would you have had the freedom of, a, of an evangelical fundamentalist Christian, all the freedom, and gone into the Catholic Church with all its rules. <laughs> she said, I left all that. They want to control your life. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I wanted to say to her, and I did, if you knew the beauty and the fullness and the freedom, all of creation is restored to me now. And in fact, that gal called me a month ago, and she said to me, I feel like I've been lost in the woods, and I see through the trees a chimney with the puff puff of the smoke coming <laughs> out and I'm coming home. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great. Great. Let's go into that a little bit more because those that are Catholic may not understand what we meant by the uh, the worldly separation and those that aren't Catholic may not understand the freedom. You've talked about yes. that. What, about, what do we mean by this worldly separation that's so common amongst fundamentalism? Well, I know when I became Catholic, um, I tried beer and I learned to polka. <laughs> <laughs> You, would I have done this series with you if I knew that? <laughs> I don't know. It's too late now. <laughs> Which episode are you going to do that on? I don't <laughs> like beer. It's too late for me. <laughs> um, I understand that very much uh, because coming from the kind of fundamentalism I was raised in, there were a lot, a lot of things that real Christians would never do. Mm -hmm. And as I was becoming a Catholic, I met holy people who drank beer. Mm -hmm. You know, we never had a drop of alcohol in our home. Our communion... Our Lord's Supper was grape juice. We never, in fact, we had sermons on why the wine in the Bible wasn't wine, it was grape juice. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. And so there, there's, there is a culture you come into. And it, from fundamentalism, it looks like sort of a wild and crazy culture. But if you look at scripture, it looks like the church. Mm. Because Jesus says, I'll haul in my dragnet and there'll be good fish and there'll be bad fish. So the real church of Jesus Christ is full of characters. But the good fish can still drink the beer. The good fish can drink <laughs> beer. <laughs> well, there's this 
the issue of vices and virtues. I, I, maybe before when we were caught up in the worldly separations, we didn't have a clear understanding of what we could say were vices and virtues, so we kind of invented these things. If you do this, it's a vice, and if you do this, it's a virtue. Whereas the vices and virtues that we understand as Catholics are attitudes behind these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. things are not. Things are amoral. Things are neutral. Right. Right. They're new. God created it good. It's how we use it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whether we use it as intended purpose, or we use it more than we should, mm -hmm. or we use it to hurt someone else, and behind that are the vices and virtues of, yes. of, of charity, you know, of patience, mm -hmm. and long-suffering that then help us use the things in their correct mode. But you know, I think that the, the motive behind the worldly separation of the fundamentalist is very beautiful. It is. Yeah. Because it comes from an understanding, number one, of the fallenness of creation, mm -hmm. beyond what the Catholic understanding is of total depravity and it's, it's uh, corrupt. Mm -hmm but also because of the, the abuses of certain things which in of, of themselves are neutral. Um, the fundamentalist, the evangelical, the one who, whose God, heart God has changed wants to give honor and glory to God. Mm -hmm. And if, if drinking to excess uh, has destroyed some and not brought glory to God, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do away with it altogether mm -hmm. to not even give the, yes. as, the impression of evil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, not to contribute to an industry that might bring the downfall mm -hmm. of some. It, the, the motive behind it was the honor and glory of God. And of course, the lack of understanding with that is the fact that what God made is good. Mm -hmm. And we could misuse that, but Christ, by his infinite grace, seeks to destroy, uh, d to destroy restore mm -hmm. uh, nature yes. and us to the dignity for which he intended it. Of course, a good chapter in the scriptures, Galatians 5, where Paul talks about that tension between legalism that sets mm -hmm. up these yes. rules that therefore kind of corral us in, all right, or the libertinism, taking our freedoms too far. Too far. Right. And sadly, there have been Catholics have taken their freedoms too far, you know, and have not always set up a good model for us. So, you know, mea culpa, uh, you know, but for the grace of God, uh, go I. So we, we need to look at our lives I think it's important for we as Catholics to understand the freedom to, as you said, look at how our freedoms might be misunderstood by others. Mm -hmm. And as Paul said, it may be all right for me to do this, but if in doing it I'm a stumbling block, right. then yes. maybe I shouldn't do it. Yes. Let's go to our next email. Ready? It's addressed to me, but I'm going to throw it over to you too. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your show. It's a real inspiration to me as a Catholic seminarian. I have a question that I think Kristen can relate to. I know that in many countries in Latin America, that were once entirely Catholic have now become increasingly Protestant. What can we in this country do to help people in Latin America learn and defend their faith? Keep up the good work, Matt, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Your oh, neck of the woods. Hey, all right. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Is it cold at home? It's really nice here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a robin. Um, that's a good question. I only lived in two Latin American countries, and I'm not an expert. And at the time, I didn't give a thought to the Catholic Church, really. So I'm, I'm just going to be answering this from my, my just purely my opinion. Um, Catholics in Latin America are very, very easy to de-evangelize. They, um, they are uncatechized. A lot of them have only been baptized. They believe in the Bible. They believe in God. They believe they're sinners. They believe in heaven and hell. And they believe that the Bible is true. They don't know much else. So what, what can be done is, first of all, prayer. We must pray yes. for the church in Latin America, and especially now that Our Lady of Guadalupe, had the, her feast day has been made for a feast day for all of North America. We need to plead with her, for her intercession. Um, these are precious people who, they love God. They want to be Christians. They don't know their faith. And, and the other thing is that Protestant churches in America give a lot of money millions and millions and millions of dollars to do what I call de-evangelize the, the Catholics. And um, I think if American Catholics, if they realize how important it is that they would give, that we need to yeah. give, we need to give to the, the Latin American fund, we need, to get, we need to give of our prayers and of our time, and we need to be aware that we are a hemisphere that has been cath mostly Catholic. If you look at Brazil and, and the Spanish-speaking countries all the way to Mexico, uh, for 500 years, 
-hmm. And it's, it's eight million Catholics a year leave the Catholic Church in Latin America and go into Protestant sects. Eight million a year, 8,000, I mean, it's three clean. million a day. Three million a year, 8,000 a day. Thank you. <laughs> I knew it was numbers. <laughs> anyway, three million a year leave. Um, so it's a serious problem. It's I know something you'd tragic. also talked about once before, and that is that the, when the faith is delivered by non-Catholics, especially from America through missionaries to South America, that what the South Americans receive isn't just the faith. There's a lot of American yeah. ideas and right. values and culture that's right. involved with that. And of course, the danger is that with all the different perspectives on the different faith, it really sets up a confusing situation for them. Well, if you look at what happened in Europe when, pro when Catholic company countries became Protestant, politically, socially, and everything, um, that's the logical conclusion of Protestantism. I wish we could raise up an army of catechists to blitz all of America and yeah. help Catholics know what they have. Now the program that you're going to be doing, um, you're, you're thinking very consciously that this is also specifically going to be translated for the Latin American countries, isn't that right? Yes. yes. Is yes. it going to be shaped, your discussions or topics in that way? I would say I, basically for all of, all of America, all of America, North and South, Latin America, Northern America, all. Um, and um, I think our, our, uh, our hearts, it's for everyone, but I, I think if it was directed to anyone more specifically, it, it was, it's more the housewife, it's more the mother at home that uh, is struggling to raise her children, to keep them Catholic, and may, not, and may be, as Chris said, sincere, love God, love her faith, but not really know it because she hasn't been taught it, or at least taught it in a way that she could then teach her children. And um, I think our hearts are geared toward housewives, North America, Latin America, um, to help them to know their faith and to raise godly Catholic families. Mm -hmm. Evangelization always involves going across cultural barriers, doesn't it? I mean, in, the, yes. in both of your journeys, I mean, from the Jewish faith and culture to Catholicism, in your case, talking about sharing it in Latin America to Catholicism, but even in the, the short at the short distance, within family, yes. within friends, oh. right. in America, different levels. There's always this enculturation that we have to break through to share the gospel. Yes. And so in your own program, you know, I, uh, you know my, my prayer is that the Spirit leads you to be able to, to help the audience break that's, the cultural barriers. That's mm -hmm. our that's desire our very, very much. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. I will remind you, we're watching, uh, that you're a very important part of this program. So if you have questions for us, Start calling in at 1-800-221-9460, and we'll be back just a moment with your call. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guests for this evening are Chris Franklin and Rosalind Moss, who are again with us on the program after sharing their journey on The Journey Home about a year or so, a year and a half ago almost. Mm -hmm. But they're also here because they're active in a project here at EWTN, a 16-part project which they'll be filming next week, which is sharing the gospel um, and uh, covering different topics. Yeah that are of help, and particularly you said you're gearing this to, to women, to right? To women, to the most vulnerable, <laughs> the most <laughs> vulnerable people, uh, the people who are the most vulnerable for being evangelized out of the church. We want to shore up their faith. Yes. All right, we've had a lot of questions about these very things, which is good. Your background as a, previously a missionary uh, to South America, and then you brought up in the Jewish yes. tradition. Yes. Let's take our first email back 
It says, Dear Christine, Rosalind, and Marcus, I am a convert to the Catholic Church, six years, but no one else in my family has followed me. In fact, my father, who is dying of a terminal illness, has no apparent faith in Christ. What can I do to help him and the rest of my family believe? Sincerely in Christ, Sarah from New Hampshire. Mm. My guess is that there's a lot of people who are listening that have similar experiences of people in their family that they wish would accept the whole truth. Yeah. What do you think? How, what can I do to help him and the rest of my family believe? Well, that's my dad, right there. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they're talking about my own father who was raised Catholic and left the church when he was 30, and now he's 86. Mm. And he, he knows a lot. He knows about Jesus. He's read the Bible. He's been around Christians. My mother was devout. We were raised. And he seems to have no interest, you mm. know. And um, we can't help but want to mm. ask our parents what's yeah. going to happen, you know. So I, I would say that the most important thing we can do, first of all, is pray. And, and remember that pray for the gift of faith yes. because that is a, something God gives to us. Some people, if you ask them, why aren't you a Christian? They'd say, I can't believe it. Yeah. And that can believe, it, it's not just a matter of the will. It's a gift from God, the ability to believe. So if we pray for the people we love, we pray for yeah. that faith, that gift of faith. And we depend on God's mercy. And you began by confirming the fact that this isn't, it's common, but it's a, not an easy no. question because there's the supernatural here. There's the mystery of God's grace. It, well, I'm just thinking it's the hardest thing, as Sarah's pointing out, it's the hardest thing to, to witness to your family. They know you uh, very, very, very hard in that case. And um, I know this could be frustrating in a sense because we, we want things to happen if we could only yeah. make people mm -hmm. believe, but there's two things that, that come to my mind. One is the most comforting thought in the world to me, Romans chapter 1, that God has put within the heart of every individual the knowledge of himself. And St. Augustine's words that the heart is restless until it finds its rest in him is true for every individual on the face of the earth. And when I meet people even who, now I don't know about Sarah's father here, but who are even confident their lives seem to be going all right, um, I wish they had a need. I wish they, at least they, they do have a need, but I wish they knew their need. But whether they show it or not, whether they are so aware of it or not, I know that apart from Christ, the human heart is empty. It, it, to a point that it recognizes it. We will not have our, our beings fulfilled until we are joined back with the God who made us for himself. Mm -hmm. So that's a confidence I have. Mm -hmm. And just perhaps, Sarah, as much as we can live before our family as witnesses of the uh, unconditional love of God, and as Mother Teresa says, preach, you, ju well, you just said it, St. Francis, not Mother Teresa, uh, preach the gospel always when absolutely necessary, use words. Um, I've known families where it's been a very difficult case, but after so long, so much resistance, um, one of them has come to the, the believing person and said, what do you have? Yeah. What do you have? Yeah, it's, it's difficult because especially many of us at one time in our life are, are so uh, you know, bold with our faith, with family and friends that we can go through time and turn on everybody off <laughs> and they don't want to hear us anymore. I did with my own family yeah, well, initially. And so it's difficult and so later when you, when, when discussion is reestablished, you're hesitant. All right. But um, especially as this, this person wrote, Sarah, about her father who has a terminal illness, um, it, it puts a, a Time. Pressure. Time on yeah. it. You don't want to take it for granted, but you don't know what to say. And so you'll want to help the person. You want to reach out to the person. You want to talk to them about your faith. But in the time you have, you also want the relationship. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult. So, I mean, mm -hmm. prayer is important. But I suppose there comes a time when we have to figure out how to sit down and okay. say, we've got to talk about Dad, I want to tell you about the most important thing in my life. Yeah, yeah it's hard. So maybe mm -hmm. the best thing to do is when you're ready to do that, 
get a bunch of other people praying behind yes. you. Yeah, really. So that this, because again, yeah, it's a gift of grace. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I believe in Jesus Christ. I can't pat myself on the back. It was God's grace, each one of us. Mm -hmm. And so we have to pray. I mean, it'd be great to pray for healing for this person, but I think yes. sometimes that God holds back healing from people uh, so that they've got to be able to understand why God heals them. Right. So yes. that they ask and they want, so that if they are healed, they understand why it's happening. Mm -hmm. right. And, and, it's not, and it may be the very illness that finally brings them we have to, pray. Yeah. to faith. So we, we would ask everyone who's watching to especially pray for Sarah and her father and family. And I would, I would say, if I could say to Sarah's dad, I would say to Sarah's dad that um, if there's a God, and if he made us for himself, a God of love who gave his son to die that we might live, uh, it, it wouldn't hurt, or I'll translate that into Yiddish, it wouldn't hurt <laughs> to um, all by yourself uh, to say, God, if you're there, and if Jesus Christ is your son, and I can know that and know him, would you show me that? Mm -hmm. God will not refuse the prayer of That's a heart right. that turns to him. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the reasons we have that picture behind us here on the stage of mm -hmm. the prodigal son, mm -hmm. yes. the father whose arms are always open. Yes, I right. love that. The son will come home. Always. Right. Thank you. Let's take our next caller. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? I'm Steve, I'm from Wisconsin. Hello, Steve, what's your question? Uh, well, I'll try to make it quick. Um, I'm getting married July 31st. Mazel tov. I'm sorry? Mazel tov. <laughs> Mazel tov. That, congratulations. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, anyway, I'm Catholic, and my fiance is non-denominational, but she was raised Baptist. And I, I want to know, my mother isn't coming to the wedding because she thinks she's, it's a big sin if she goes to a uh, non-denominational church, which is what we're getting married in. And I want to know if there's a way that this marriage can be blessed. And because I really need her to be there. And I want to know how I would go about doing that. Because right. she thinks I'm damned okay. for doing this. And the, the marriage isn't going to last more than two years. So I need some suggestions on what to do. All right, thank you. Well, we're not theologians or canon lawyers mm, here. But you but were a pastor. I was a pastor. <laughs> All right. You take it first, though, because no. I think, and, I, and in no way am I belittling this, because this is the thing that's happening mm -hmm. very frequently in America, especially today when we have, we're surrounded by so many different traditions. And, uh, and sadly, many young people are not getting the kind of mer premarital encouragement and training that leads them in, in, into situations. And, um, uh, what's your thoughts to help them first? Well, I'll, I, I can tell you, Steve, as a married person, I sincerely cannot imagine being happily married and not sharing my faith. Um, I've been blessed with a husband who shares my faith. We married both evangelicals. Our journey to the Catholic faith was at the same time. Um, it's I, I, I feel for your mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have children and I would be very sorry if they married outside of the church. But as far as helping your mother understand whether you're damned or not, um, she, she needs to talk to the priest. Maybe you and your mother and your priest and your dad, if he's involved, you could sit down together and talk about what happens when a Catholic marries another baptized Christian who's non-Catholic. That, that, would be my, that would be where I would say to start, right there mm -hmm. in your own parish with your parish priest and your mother. Yeah. Get that worked out so you know the facts. Very good. Would you like to add that, Ross? <laughs> oh, Steve, um, and I'm single uh, and, and have never been married, but I, um, you're, you're starting on, on maybe what is a, a bit of a difficult road, maybe not, maybe not. I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I wish and I pray that God will bless your marriage. You both have your faith in Christ. You both belong to him. For you as a Catholic to, um, 
not be able to share the fullness of the faith that is yours in the Eucharist, above all, I always think of, is, is, has got to be very difficult. Um, I know it's got to be deeply hurtful for your mother. I, I, I understand that. Um, from my heart, uh, I would say respect her. If, if she cannot come in to the wedding because of her faith and her convictions, I think you need to respect that and love her and do what you can uh, after the wedding to build the relationship with her, um, to have her get to be part of your family. And as far as her thinking you're damned, um, she's doing that out of the state that she's in at the moment and you might be able to help her in the future to understand certain things and, and you might, her priest, you might even be able to talk to her priest, that someone that might be able to help her as well. Yeah, I'd like to say something to you also. First of all, I would strongly encourage you to meet with your priest yourself to talk with him to answer this question. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. your priest is, is the informed one that God has placed in your area in your life to help you work through this. My own feeling at this is that scripture says to not be unequally yoked. There's great wisdom there because of how absolutely central and significant your faith is for your life, for your marriage, for your family, for eternity. It is not something to be put number three, four, five, six, or seven on your list of priorities. It's to be number one. And so you need to examine that in your own life because what you're doing is stepping outside of your faith, marrying elsewhere, and you're putting your faith as a lesser importance in your life. And this is maybe a hard statement, but Jesus called his followers that sometimes we have to set aside family and friends to follow Jesus. And so you have to examine the purpose and the reason you're being called to this marriage. Is it becoming a contradiction to your own faith? But I think you need to examine this with your priest, your spiritual director, to help you to make sure you're hearing God as you're being called to this marriage. Mm -hmm. Let's take our next email, if we would. Dear Marcus, Rosalind, and Chris, praise be Jesus Christ. Do you have any suggestions for evangelizing people within the church? There seems to be an unofficial schism within the church in America that's very distressing to those of us who embrace her tradition, traditional magisterial teachings. I personally know several church employees with degrees in theology, etc., who don't believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. I've been called unecumenical <coughs> and narrow-minded for insisting that the Protestant denominations don't have the Eucharist. Long live the Pope, Teresa <laughs> Ferguson in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> How do you evangelize in the church people who are teaching positions that are contrary to the church's teaching? Where do you want to begin? Rosalind. How do you evangelize people that are teaching contrary to the church's well, teaching? With people within the church. How do you yeah. break through those barriers? Well, uh, you know, as you were even reading the email, the word that flashed the neon lights before me is love. Yeah. We can't approach anyone if our heart... The thing is what you said before, Marcus. Why, I, when, I, when God brought me to Christ to begin with, I would walk the streets of Los Angeles and look at everybody that was lost and say, why did he, do, why did he save me? Yeah. Why did he bring me to, to, into a relationship with him? And now into the Catholic Church, when everyone who mentored me is an evangelical who swims circles around me theologically in every other way, and their love for God, why did he bring me into the fullness? And if, if God has so graced us that we love with all our being our Holy Father and the teachings of the church and we will not compromise. That is a grace and we are the richer children for it. So my first thought is if we come across people who aren't teaching that, why they're not teaching that, we don't know yeah, yet. Yeah. We don't know that, but there by the grace of God go I. So my thought is to, to love them, to come to understand why they believe what they believe, and we would say, in a sense, earn the opportunity to begin to mm -hmm. tell them, teach them, show them what you think is, is a truer way. I, I couldn't agree with you more because if we try and figure out why they're, where they're coming from or why and their motives, it's very difficult. It's, we've got to love them. It's not easy, though, especially when you see 
decisions being made at the local level that are, are seemingly hurting people in the parish, yeah. it's very difficult. And I, I recently heard uh, someone uh, tell what Mother Angelica's advice was at one point when someone was so upset because of what was happening in their mass locally. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You start, you know, lighting torches and um, getting the tar and feathering out. And, and what do you do? And she said, well, it, I'm not sure this is all her advice. I can't speak for mother. But what I was told was that she advised the person to close their eyes in the midst of the mass and pray. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't get caught up on, on the stuff that's going on. And if you pray, you center in on, you concentrate on the mass and realize what's happening, the reality of Christ here in the Eucharist, you, you can re receive from that Eucharist, That's and then in that midst of that prayer, the power of God can bring change into a situation. Mm -hmm. right. Let's take our next call. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Um, yes, Denise from New Jersey. Hello, Denise. What's your question for us? Um, well, I, I was raised Catholic, and when I was 17, I left, and I went to the Protestant Church because I was so unfulfilled. Yeah. And now I'm 35, I'm married, and I have a daughter. My, I married a Catholic man, and we got married in the Catholic Church. Yeah. And since my daughter was born 16 months ago, I've been feeling pulled back to the church. Bizarre. I don't understand where this is coming from because I really don't like the Catholic Church. Yeah. And I'm confused. But I've talked to a friend of mine who's very Catholic and very, I guess, knows the Lord, as I would put it, right? And she's been mentoring me. But I'm having a couple difficulties with certain um, yeah. teachings, and I'm really... Purgatory is one of them. The absolution that the priest gives you is really being difficult for me. Um, and baptism of children, because I didn't baptize my child. And that's another thing that, that is drawing me back. I don't know, for some reason I want her baptized, and I don't know where this is coming from. I'm assuming it's all coming from God, and that he wants me back here. Maybe my daughter is going to be a nun or a saint or something. And I mean, I, it sounds funny, but you have to know that I was a real Catholic basher for a long time. Well, first thing we do is we're going to pray for you in the midst of your journey because we've been there and we know the struggle especially with the, some of those topics because of where we bet. came from yes. what do you think purgatory penance well absolution we're going to talk about all of that on our series but she can't wait that long <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, god has god has the answer the catholic church has all the answers to all of your questions it's just a matter of time it's all there every single piece right. of the puzzle is in the box i promise you and it just takes a while to find them all. Yeah. 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 Is it Catherine? Pardon? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't get um, It's purgatory. You want to make a yes. comment on purgatory? And, and just a preliminary comment. Yeah. I want to say to you, don't be afraid. Don't, mm -hmm. be afraid. don't be afraid. It's our Holy Father's right. words. Don't be afraid. Don't ever be afraid to seek truth. There is only one who is truth. You never have to be afraid. When we seek God with all our heart, we don't have to fear. And I say that now, you forgive were, me, because I was, so I was very afraid <laughs> that I was being led I astray. Was I, I was very afraid yes. that I could be, be de yes. being deceived by the enemy yeah. of our souls. Mm -hmm. but, but when we, and it was Christ I clung to those four and a half years of my journey. And, and when we seek truth, uh, God won't let us go astray. Um, purgatory is extraordinarily beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it's extraordinarily beautiful. And, and let me just say, um, if I zeroed in on the difference between the evangelical understanding of uh, what happens after death and the Catholic, um, we know that when we die, as an evangelical or Catholic, we know that as, as much as God has saved us to conform us to the image, image of his son, and we strive to be holy and perfect, we're not. And not a one of us, well, some perhaps, but most of us won't be perfect at death. You were so, pointing at me. Uh, uh, <laughs> most people <No>. won't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when we leave the earth, when we die physically, as a Christian, we know we're going to heaven. But we die with sin. When we stand before Christ, we will be without sin. We'll be totally, perfectly pure when we stand face to face with him. We won't be dung hills as Luther taught, covered over with righteousness, because dung hills don't get into heaven. We will be perfectly pure and perfectly holy, yet we leave the earth without being perfectly pure and perfectly holy. The question then is, what happens between our physical death 
and are standing face to face before Christ in heaven. How do we get from still having sin to entering heaven with no sin where nothing unclean will enter heaven? How do we get from one state to the other? And when I've asked my evangelical friends that, they would say what I said, uh, God will do it. And that's the Catholic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. God will do it. The question is how. It begins with a P. <laughs> <laughs> but purgatory, could I just say, purgatory is love. Purgatory is the fire of God's love. Purgatory is God's love purging us for the, from the remains of self, which is the cause and root of all sin. And the pain of purgatory, my understanding that the greatest pain of purgatory will be that we are, have left the earth, we, we want nothing of it anymore, mm -hmm. nothing of it, and our focus is on God because we've never been so close to God as we will be. And we will never love Him as much. We will never long for Him like we will when we're there. And the pain of purgatory is the pain of a heart that so loves and longs for God and can't have Him fully yet. That's the pain. It's the pain of love. Mm -hmm. I will encourage the listeners to pick up the catechism mm -hmm. because there you're going to hear yes. the heart of it. That's a wonderful description. Mm -hmm. And in the catechism, be able to cover all those other topics. And it'd be Everything. nice if they had the catechism along with your series as you're, mm -hmm. yes. you're following it. Let's take maybe this last email because we're, the time goes so short here. Dear Journey Home, I am 32 and was recently married in a Catholic church. My husband is what I tend to call deeply Catholic. You ladies appear to have such peace with your decision. I am tremendously conflicted about my journey towards Catholicism today. I am an RCIA and what I am learning makes sense. However, I experience emotional upheaval when I think that I believed incorrectly in my Pentecostal Protestant belief system. Mm -hmm. I also, quote, accepted Christ at age five and devoted my life to living a Christ-like life from that moment on. I buried myself in study of the word and in youth ministry. On your journey, when did you feel, here's the question, when did you feel, quote, de-conflicted okay. about your decision to become Catholic? I want to know this is the right decision. God mm. bless you. I don't mm. see your name on the email, Dom. Mm. God bless her. When did, yeah, so we've been there. <laughs> we when did have. you feel? Can I tell you truthfully? Yeah. About six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain that. <laughs> we only have two minutes now. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Because um, it's a whole nother world. It's a whole nother world. And to think that I came to know God who totally changed my life and I didn't know him. What, as I said before, what God did I know? I knew the right God, but he is so bi much bigger and different, it seems. And so I meant that now, even though I'm in a, the Catholic Church and I knew it was right, I had to let my feelings uh, kind of uh, be on the sideline. I understood it was right, um, and I'm Catholic, and I've never regretted that, but for the longest time, I even felt like an outsider, and I still do a little bit, mm -hmm. because it's such a different world. It's such a different okay. world. But do I want the God that I came to know, in a sense, as I came to know him, oh. as I perhaps fashioned in my mind because I was taught that way, or do I want, at any cost, the God who is in all his fullness, mm -hmm. and of him I don't have to be afraid, even though it may take me time to see him in a new way. He's still the God who gave his son. So. When were you detached? Um, culturally, I think I, I'll always feel a little bit like a foreigner, because see. I wasn't born Catholic. Yeah. There's a, a sense of foreignness about it. But I would say it, uh, that the, the, when I knew I was going to become a Catholic. When we decided we have to be Catholic, there was no question anymore. Mm. We had to do it. And when I received Jesus in the Eucharist for the first time, it was the best moment of my life. One of the reasons that we call both this program, The Journey Home, and the book, that The Coming Home Network, Journeys Home, is because it is a journey. Yeah. It isn't just a journey to the Catholic Church. This is really centrally a journey of following Jesus Christ. Wherever He'll lead us, Sometimes in places we don't want to go or uncomfortable or we have to leave things behind that were so important. Mm -hmm. But it's a journey home. The journey home is coming to a quick end mm -hmm. tonight. Thank you so much, both of you. Your program, The Household of Faith, yes. will be uh, uh, maybe tentatively showing this fall. Yes. This fall. Yes. Yeah. God bless. Thank you so much. Thanks. We pray for the program, that the Spirit will speak through you. 
and uh, boy, maybe I'll get you back on the program then when you're <laughs> here, you know, we can talk more about issues of the faith. Thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Thank we thank you for joining us on the journey home. You're always a welcome part of this journey as we talk about our journey of faith, and especially in Open Line First Fridays, you are in so much an important part. Thank you for your questions, and until we meet again on the journey home, may God bless and guide you as you follow Jesus Christ. Thank mm -hmm. you.